One Sunday morning in Dublin, Ireland, 1925, the body of a man was found lying in the street. No one knew who he was. His body was taken to a nearby convent where the sisters took care of it. When they removed the clothing, it was discovered many chains were wrapped around the arms and legs and torso. Word spread and soon the body was identified as Matthew Talbot. Had it not been for those chains, his story would never have been known. Matt Talbot was a quiet man who never talked about himself. Very humble and very much to himself, he came across as an ordinary workman who was seen here and there around town and in church. Other than that, there was nothing about him that made people suspect his great holiness. Everything we know about him today has been collected from interviews by those who knew him. Matthew Talbot was born to good Catholic parents in Dublin, Ireland, May 2, 1856. Despite his Catholic upbringing, he had very little faith and was very uninspired by it. All of his brothers, except the oldest, were hard drinkers. He hated school. He wasn't very bright. At age 12, he began to work as a messenger boy for a wine merchant. It was here that he began to sample the drinks. By 13 years old, he was addicted. This went on for years, and soon he began to work at the docks. He would cash his paycheck at the bar and keep a running tab. When it was low, the barmaid would let him know by his request, and he would quickly run to the pawn shop to sell some clothing or item that he had on hand. Once he was so desperate for a drink, but had nothing left to pawn except his shoes. So he pawned his shoes and walked home in his socks. Another time, he even stole a violin from a violinist to pawn. Later, after his conversion, he would try to make up for this by buying back the violin and track down the owner, which he wasn't able to find. Instead, he used the money to have a mass said for him. One day, after not having any money or anything left to pawn, he waited outside the pub for his friends, hoping one of them would offer to buy him a drink. However, one by one, they all passed him up, leaving him outside with no offers. Disgusted, he decided then and there to take the pledge, which meant to not drink for three months. If it was possible to stay sober for three months, then a six-month pledge was taken, then a year pledge, and then, finally, a lifelong pledge. His mother, having heard this before, needed to see it to believe it. She told him if he was going to take the pledge, to take it, but to never break it. Before taking the pledge, Matt went to confession and then Mass. This was the first time he received the sacraments in three years. In the beginning, it was very hard for Matt, as the drink of alcohol called him from the moment he opened his eyes in the morning. Normally, he would get up and do some sweeping jobs at the pub to earn him a free drink but now he had no routine. Feeling vulnerable and weak, he escaped to the only place he felt safe, a church, where he would hide all day from alcohol and his friends. He would pray the rosary at times and he would go to confession when it was offered, but mostly he would just sit. It had been a long time since he prayed and he felt no connection to God. He only knew that he hurt and thirsted for a drink. But still, he stayed away, seeking refuge in the church. It was on Saturday that Matt had taken the pledge, and now on Monday, he had to go back to work. The need for a drink had his skin crawling and kept him from sleeping, so he rose early to go to Mass. However, he was too early even for Mass, and the church doors were locked. Tempted to go to the pub to do his usual sweeping chore for a drink, he again committed himself to his pledge and knelt down on the stone steps to wait. In the moment, he knelt to merely distract himself from the ever-consuming desire to drink. Even the cold, hard steps cutting into his knees were better than the constant craving and thirst. But kneeling would become a way of handling his cravings, and eventually, a way of doing penance. In later years, he would kneel nearly all the time, in prayer, while eating, while reading, and while writing. This was his way of practicing penance and keeping a strict hold over his senses. He continued this ritual all week, to go to Mass the morning, go to work, and then go back to church to hide. With his first payday coming up, his work friends invited him to go to the pub with them, as per usual, 
asking him where he had been all week. It was at the pub that they would cash their checks, and this was partly the reason why drinking had become such an easy habit. But now for the first time, Matt wasn't going to cash in his check for the barmaid to keep his tab. Instead, he bought a bottle of mineral water, which he drank in front of his friends who watched him in disbelief. Then he put the bottle down, turned on his heel, and hurried back to the church. Those first few weeks and months were very hard for Matt. He, who was in his 30s, was still living at home with his parents and younger siblings. He was still dependent on them for food and clothing. He had quit his job and began to work as a bricklayer and proved to be a hard worker and good at his job. But almost daily, he would tell his mother hopelessly, It's no use. I won't last another day without drinking. One day, his sister wanted to surprise him with a present as a reward for his hard work. It was a book titled, Hell Open to Christians. Matt was not much of a reader, and if he were, this was not a book he would have chosen. First of all, he wasn't really sure he believed in hell or Satan. His years of drinking had dulled his senses. But now, as he paged through the book with drawings of hell and demons, he said thank you to his sister and read the book. It is said that he read it over and over throughout his life, so much that he had to bind the cover back on. It was found on his bedside table the day of his death. This book would sharpen his senses again and help him to regain his spiritual footing that he lost. It is said that even though Matt himself didn't take much stock in the existence of hell and Satan, he once had an encounter with him as he was waiting for the church to open. One day, as he was kneeling on the steps, waiting for the doors to open, he suddenly felt someone shove him down onto his face. He got up, ready to fight, but no one was there. The doors of the church had then opened, and he ran in, confused and frightened. Another time, he struggled with Satan who tried to keep Matt from receiving communion. Just as he stepped into line to receive, the overwhelming temptation of despair and that he would never reform made him leave the church. He wandered around the city just to find himself in front of another church. So he stayed for that Mass, only for the same thing to happen. Again, he left the church without receiving communion, feeling lost and helpless. Once more, he found himself at the third church, which was having a late morning mass, but this time he found he couldn't get himself to even walk in. He threw himself to the ground in front of the church, moaning and groaning. Thinking he was just another drunk, no one tried to help him. He cried out to the Blessed Mother, begging her for her help and begging her to not let him go back to the drink. And suddenly the temptation was lifted and he felt the strength to stand and go inside the church. This time he was able to receive with no problem. Because he was so fearful of going back to his old ways, as his desire for a drink was still so rampant, he took charge of his body by fasting. He reasoned that he always had to be stronger than his desires. This meant denying the natural passions of the body, such as the want for food. First, it was skipping a meal or two during the day, and then he began to abstain from meat three times a week. This helped him overcome his desire for alcohol immensely, And his mother noted that this is when he stopped telling her that he could no longer live without alcohol. To remind himself of his promise in new life, he kept two pins on his coat sleeve in the form of a cross. To anyone else who noticed the two pins, they assumed they kept it on his clothes for any tears or rips. But for Matt, they were a reminder to him of atonement and penance. Matt was known for speaking his mind and sometimes being too blunt. And with his eyes wide open to see what drinking does to the body and soul, he began to urge his brothers to stop their drinking. This did no good, of course, and only caused anger and friction between them, and Matt ended up having to move out. He rented an apartment down the street from his parents' house with the arrangement of his sister Mary coming to cook and clean from time to time. On one of those times that Mary came over to do some cleaning for Matt, she noticed two planks of wood in the corner of the apartment. When she asked him about it, thinking he was just keeping it for scraps and that he should get rid of it, he just shrugged and said evasively, I have my reasons for it. On Mary's next visit, when Matt was at church, Mary noticed that the planks of wood had been moved to his iron bed, covered with a thin blanket. He also began to use a wooden plank as a pillow, 
which eventually caused him deafness in later years. As to whether Mary confronted Matt about this or not is unknown, but regardless, he kept up his penance. As mentioned before, a big part of Matt's penance and rule over his body was his constant kneeling. He did this every day, almost all day. It is said by those who went to daily Mass alongside him that he was seen to kneel after Mass for up to six or seven hours at a time, kneeling upright without leaning on anything, totally motionless. He normally kept all these things to himself, but he told a friend one time that he did this because he found that staying on his knees, absolutely motionless, helped him to focus better. Although there's no evidence of it, it's suspected by many that Matt had visions or locutions from the Blessed Mother. His mother stated that in his younger days, she used to urge him to find a good Catholic girl, secretly hoping that she would help him reform his ways. After his conversion, she continued to pester and urge him, mainly because now that her son was back on the right track, she wanted to see him married and happy. However, Matt never had any interest in marriage until one day, he met a woman who pursued him. He had been working on the house of a customer, and she was the cook. She got to know Matt and was impressed by his humility and love of God. They developed a friendship, and she eventually proposed marriage to him, since she realized he probably wouldn't be the one to do it. He told her that he would pray a novena to the Blessed Mother about it, and at the end of nine days, he told her that marriage was not in his life for him. According to a trusted friend, He had told him that the Blessed Virgin had told him not to marry. He would talk to the Blessed Virgin often, and after his father died and his mother moved in with Matt, she would often wake up in the middle of the night to hear Matt talking to the Blessed Virgin, as though in conversation. Knowing that he was a private man who didn't like to share much about his spiritual life, she never asked him any more about it. Along with his penances of fasting and kneeling, Matt would also wake at two in the morning, which is when he had the conversations with Our Lady. Sometimes, his mother would see him suddenly fall prostrate on the floor, his arms out in the form of a cross, as though he were throwing himself at Our Lady's feet. He would stay awake praying, and then go to the five o'clock Mass, arriving an hour early as usual, to kneel and wait on the stone steps. He had prayed for the grace of perseverance and the grace of a prayer life, and he got both. He prayed all day long as he worked, stopping for the Angelus, regardless that his co-workers at times would smirk or make fun. He was in constant contemplation of God. When his co-workers used God's name in vain, he would take off his hat in reverence. When he got home, he would kiss the crucifix even before kissing his mother. After his meager dinner of a few vegetables and a bit of tea, they would say the rosary together, a few litanies, and read a little of the saints. His favorite saints were St. Therese the Little Flower, as well as St. Teresa of Avila and St. Mary of Egypt. He was a man that spoke simply, and he would call them his grand ladies. Matt was not a good student when he was a boy, and he hated school. Learning didn't come easily for him, but by the power of the Holy Spirit, he could understand the deepest theological books. After his death, books of philosophers and theologians as well as notes that were written on scraps of paper that were hung all over the walls were found by his bed. When the Dublin lockout of 1913 led to sympathy strikes throughout the city, Matt's work, including Matt, came out, although he didn't join the picket line. At first, Matt refused his strike pay, saying that he didn't earn it. Later, he did accept it, but asked that it be shared out among the other strikers. Violent riots broke out in the streets of Dublin from non-union men when they tried to run the tram cars. The picketers rebelled, and soon a huge fight broke out, bringing the police to charge into the crowd that had innocent men, women, and children, and beat them with batons. Matt spent most of his time during the lockout in the church, kneeling upright and praying for his friends, co-workers, and family. Eventually, after four months, the lockout disintegrated. Through the advice of his spiritual director, Matt wore chains underneath his clothing. They were light enough not to be seen through his clothing, but heavy enough to hold back watchdogs. He wound them tightly around his arm, waist, and leg. He kept them on his body until they were rusty, and then he would bury them and buy himself new ones. No one knew about this mortification, except for his spiritual director and his one trusted friend, Father Hickey. 
Eventually, the chains became embedded into his skin. Matt hid his prayer life and mortifications from everyone. He wanted to be hidden and unnoticed from the world to escape admirations and temptation to pride. And so, when he was invited occasionally to have dinner at someone's house, he ate their food and ate their meat, or when someone wanted to share their lunch with him, he would eat it. Thus, for this reason, no one knew of his strict fasting. He would do this only to renounce himself and to perform an act of charity to a friend. When he had to be in the hospital for his weak heart and take a few weeks to rest, he slept on their bed with their comfortable blankets. But as soon as he got home, he went back to his wooden planks. And so on the outside, he was very ordinary, but on the inside, he was extraordinary. His prayer life had grown over the years, and towards the end of his life, his prayer routine consisted of the 15 decades of the Rosary, the Rosary of Our Lady of Sorrows, the Franciscan Crown of the Seven Joys of Mary, the Little Office of the Blessed Virgin, the Immaculate Conception Chaplet, the Prayers of the Sacred Heart, the Chaplet of St. Michael the Archangel, and the Chaplet of the Holy Souls in Purgatory. This in addition to various litanies and novena prayers. On Sundays, he would attend multiple Masses, hurrying from one Mass to the next. Towards the end of his life, Matt was forced to lighten a few of his penances. He was forced to eat a little more and to not stay as long in churches praying. He was so exhausted from his poor heart and all that he put his body through that many times his sisters, who had come by to check on him now that their mother had died years before, would find him lying on his plank bed almost unconscious. They would berate him. The way you carry on, have you no mercy on yourself? Suppose something should happen to you. He would respond, If I die and there's nobody around, I'll still have Jesus and Mary with me. On June 7, 1925, Matt felt well and in good health, so much so that one of his neighbors, who saw him nearly every morning, noticed it. Thanks be to God, was his usual reply when she mentioned how well he looked. On his way to Mass, witnesses saw him put his hand on a wall that he was passing by, and then he suddenly collapsed and died. This wall today has a cross and a small plaque where Matt's body was found. As word of Matt Talbot spread, he rapidly became an icon for Ireland's Catholic temperance movement, the Pioneer Total Abstinence Association. His story soon became known around the world. Many addiction clinics, youth hostels, and statues have been named after him. One of Dublin's main bridges is also named after him. On October 3, 1975, Pope Paul VI declared him to be Venerable Matt Talbot, which is a step on the road to canonization.